Chapter 2. The Queen and the Crown in a Parliamentary State. Like that of England, the executive is a composite organization. The English executive consists of three parts, namely, I, the Queen and the Crown, 2, the Cabinet, and 3, the Civil Service. The Queen or the Crown is former law nominal executive. The Cabinet is the real executive. The Crown and the Cabinet together constitute the political executive. The civil service is the permanent executive, inasmuch as the tenure of office of civil servants is permanent. Each executive body has different powers, functions, and position in the government of the country. The Queen, the supreme authority in England, is formally vested in the Queen, or King. British monarchy is a hereditary monarchy. Parliament regulates the law of succession to the throne. It is now regulated by the Act of Settlement of 1701. According to this Act, the Sovereign of England must be a Protestant. Succession is determined by the principle of primogeniture, that is, elder sons being always preferred to the younger and male heirs to females. If there are no sons, the daughters of the deceased Sovereign succeed him or her in order of their seniority. When a daughter succeeds, she becomes queen regnant and the powers of the crown are vested in her as fully and effectively, as though she were a king. Her husband is, however, styled as prince consort, but he has no constitutional position or powers. The Statute of Westminster, 1931, has laid down that the royal title to the throne will be assent to, not only by British Parliament but also by the member nations of the Commonwealth which owe allegiance to the Crown. Hence the Queen of Great Britain is also the head of the Commonwealth, to which nearly 32 countries belong, which were formerly British colonies or dependencies, like India, Bangladesh, Singapore Malaysia, Nigeria, Uganda, Sri Lanka, Canada, Australia, etc. Pakistan was also one its member but left it in 1972 due to the anti-Pakistan attitude of the British government and press during the Bangladesh crisis of 1971. Accession. The king is dead. Long live the king. Immediately on the death of a king or queen regnant, the new sovereign is proclaimed at an accession council to which all members of the Privy Council are summoned. But the accession ceremony is also attended by the members of the House of Lords and Commons the Lord Mayor of London, leading citizens as well as the High Commissioners of the members of the Commonwealth as the representatives of their governments. It means that there is no interregnum between the death of one sovereign and the accession of another, hence ages old cry the king is dead, long live the king. It means that the king, or queen regnant, as an individual is dead, but kingship as an institution never dies. In other words, the office, the powers, the functions and prerogatives which the king exercises as the sovereign of the country are continued by the next successor to the throne. They do not belong to the person, but to the office which the king holds. The powers and functions of the king do not come to an end for a single moment by the death of a king. So the saying the king is dead, long live the king should be paraphrased as the king as an individual person is dead, but long live the office which one has vacated and the other has assumed. In brief, the king is dead. Long live the king really means the king is dead. Long live the crown. The queen and the crown. We are at the very outset confronted with one of the unique features of the English constitution, this, the distinction between the queen and the crown. It is necessary to understand carefully this distinction. There is no distinction, said Gladstone more vital to the practice of the English constitution than that which exists between the king and the crown, between the monarch as an individual and monarchy as an institution. The English sovereign is both an individual and an institution the king and the crown. The functions and position of the two are not only different, but are increasingly becoming more and more distinct. Decline of the power of the king and increase in the powers of the crown. The whole development of the British constitution has been, in fact, marked by a steady transfer of powers and prerogatives from the king, as a person, 
to the crown as an institution. In the Middle Ages and early modern period, the kings were absolute rulers, exercising all royal powers and prerogatives, but the long constitutional struggle between the Stuart kings and their parliaments ended in the defeat of the king and the subordination of the royal authority to the parliamentary supremacy. This was the result of the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Then arose the cabinet system and prime minister who deprived the king of executive powers and functions as well. The result was that the king became a mere constitutional figurehead without any active authority or function in the government. Royal powers and prerogatives passed into the hands of parliament, the prime minister, the cabinet, or the civil departments. Thus kingship in England became constitutional. Jim ited nominal in authority and function. While the power of the king steadily decreased, the power of the crown continuously increased. The crown, that is, parliament, the prime minister, the cabinet, or civil departments exercised royal powers in the name of the king, as authorized by parliamentary laws which confer new powers on the crown, that is, on any one of these bodies. With the increasing governmental activities, new departments are set up by Parliament, as it has no time to deal with the details of the work of these departments, it necessarily confers large powers on the Crown, which makes laws in the form of orders in council. Another source of increase in the powers of the Crown are the royal prerogatives. The Crown is the fountain of justice. It summons and dissolves Parliament, appoints civil officers commands the army, navy, and air force, makes treaties, pardons criminals, and confers honors. The crown here signifies the prime minister or some other minister or official, exercising royal powers in the name of the queen. Position of the queen. The queen is the personification of the state. In law, she is the head of the executive, an integral part of the legislature the head of the judiciary, the commander-in-chief of all the armed forces of Great Britain and temporal head of the Church of England. But, in practice, she is only the constitutional head of the state. All the absolute powers of the British monarch have been, during the long evolution of the British constitution, transferred to other departments of the state. Consequently the Queen exercises all her powers only on the advice of the Prime Minister which she cannot constitutionally reject or ignore. As Badger had said she reigns, but does not rule. The country is governed by her ministers in her name. Powers of the Sovereign, in spite of the shift of powers to her ministers and her constitutional position the Queen still performs a number of important acts of government which cannot be performed by anyone else. They are legislative powers. The Queen has the sole and exclusive power to summon, open and prorogue Parliament and dissolve the House of Commons before the expiry of its five-year term. She has the power also to initiate laws on any subject. The Queen has the power to reject any bill placed before her for her signature. This is her right of absolute veto. No bill can become an act till it is signed by her, but no king of England has exercised this right since 1707. It has therefore become obsolete. Executive powers. The queen has the sole executive power of appointing all the high officials of the government, both civil and military. She is the supreme commander of all branches of the armed forces. The queen has the powers of declaring war and making peace with foreign countries. All treaties of peace and alliance are made by her. She appoints and sends ambassadors and other diplomatic representatives to foreign countries, while the ambassadors of other countries are accredited to her and are received by her. Similarly passports and safe conducts are issued in the queen's name. In short, all foreign relations and affairs are decided by the queen. The Queen holds meetings of the Privy Council, gives audience to her ministers and other officers at home and abroad, receives accounts of cabinet decision, reads official dispatches and signs innumerable state papers. The Queen is the fountain of justice. She appoints judges, and has also the power of removing them. However, she does not exercise these judicial powers. 
The Queen is the head of the Church of England. The Queen is the source of all honor and dignity. She creates peers and confers all kinds of titles and honors, like knighthood, etc. However, the Queen exercises these powers only in law. In practice she does not exercise any one of them. These powers are exercised by the Prime Minister, or the Cabinet, or Parliament in the name of the Queen or Crown. The Queen is the constitutional head of the parliamentary state. In law, she is the first and the highest official of the Crown, but in fact she exercises none of these powers. Her legal rights and powers may be great, but her actual powers are nothing. She reigns but does not rule. Her positive control over public affairs, such as appointment, legislation, military policy, the church, finance, foreign relations, is almost nil. She has become a mere figurehead, a rubber stamp, an instrument of signature. Royal prerogatives, all these powers involve the use of the royal prerogative which is defined by Dicey as the residue of discretionary authorities legally left in the hands of the crown. It means, in other words, that the powers of the queen shall always be exercised, not by her, but by her ministers or some other officers, authorized by law to do so, hence they are responsible for the royal acts. Royal prerogatives can be exercised by the ministers in three ways, by an order in council made by and with the advice of the Privy Council, by order, commission, one or warrant signed personally by the Queen, and generally bearing the signature of one or more responsible ministers, or by proclamation, writs, letters patent or other documents under the Great Seal, affixed by the Lord Chancellor in obedience to a royal warrant countersigned by a minister functions of the queen in spite of the fact that the british sovereign is now bereft of all actual powers she still performs several important functions which cannot be performed by anyone else her participation is still necessary for the smooth working of the government as shown by the functions she still performs parliament is dissolved by the queen she also orders a general election after such a dissolution. Here again the decision is taken by the cabinet before the queen actually dissolves parliament. But the cabinet has to secure the consent of the queen before it proceeds to dissolve it. The queen advises and guides the cabinet. Badger had once remarked that the British sovereign has three rights. He has the right to be consulted, the right to encourage and the point right to warn, and a sovereign of wisdom and sagacity would want nothing more peel. One of the great prime ministers of England once remarked that a king ought to know more about the government than any other man in the country. It is one of the duties of the prime minister to keep the king, or queen, informed of the proceedings and decisions of the cabinet and to listen to his, or her advice. As the sovereign, has a long experience of government, and if he is a man of sagacity and wisdom, his advice and warning would not be lightly disregarded by his ministers. The importance of royal functions is shown by the fact that the parliament by an act always provides for a regent to perform them in case the sovereign becomes for some reason totally incapable of performing them. Social leader. Monarchy plays an important and colourful role in the social life of the British nation. The Queen supplies the vital element of personal interest to the proceedings of the government. While ordinary people cannot greatly understand the working and decision of the Parliament and Cabinet, they are deeply influenced by what the King or Queen says or does. The role of the King and Queen in such matters as religion, morality, benevolence, fashion, and even art and literature is immense. The royal family sets fashion to the English society and dress and social behavior. What the king or the queen wears today the nation will wear tomorrow. So is the case in manners and morals of the English society. Imperial unity. Professor Lowell remarks that the English crown is the symbol of the imperial unity. In the words of H.G. Wells. The British crown the golden link of the ants as a symbol of imperial unity and diversity as no other crown. Nowadays this unity is symbolized by the Commonwealth, of which the Queen is the head. 
why has the monarchy survived? The English sovereign has no power and performs few functions. Why, then, has the monarchy survived in England? Some of the reasons of survival are as follows. There is no other alternative to monarchy. If kingship is abolished today, either a presidential form of the government or a parliamentary presidency will be established. In the first case, the parliamentary system of England, which is one of her greatest achievements, will be completely abolished. No Englishman wants such a change. In the second case, if the presidential democracy is established, no real change will be brought about. Instead of a king, a president will be set up. But such a president will have no traditions of the past as the English monarchy has. Therefore it is no use abolishing the traditional system of government and replacing it by a worse system. The English national temperament is conservative. The English people are attached to royalty which is steeped in historical traditions and is hoary with age. The president either of the American or the French type would not possess these historical advantages. The English society is a deferential society and has deep respect for such traditional institutions as monarchy, House of Lords and even the Conservative Party not to speak of non-political institutions, like the Oxbridge or the social elite and the public school system. Sir Ivor Jennings has aptly remarked, if the people of this country, Great Britain, want to overthrow capitalism, the public school system, the House of Lords, or the monarchy, they have the power in their hands. If they have not done so, the explanation is that they have not wanted to do so. In spite of its weakness the English monarchy still performs several important functions, as we have enumerated above. If monarchy is abolished, some other chief executive shall have to be created to perform these functions, so essential for efficient working of the parliamentary system of government. These functions are, choosing a prime minister, summoning and dissolution of parliament, royal assent to the bills, receiving ambassadors, etc. The English monarchy is the umpire who sees that the great game of politics is played according to the rules. The English king is a peacemaker between rival political parties. Lastly, the English monarchy is not a financial burden on the English exchequer. The queen and the royal family receive an annual sum of £475,000 as civil list. It is estimated that the expenses of maintaining royalty in England is barely a fraction of 1% of the total budget of the government. If monarchy is abolished and presidential system is established, it is quite possible that the president would be paid far more than the king. In other words, English monarchy is a cheaper institution as compared to the headship of other states. These are the reasons. Why British monarchy has survived in this age of democracy and republicanism.